You know him from such films as Twister, Saw, Robin Hood, Men in Tights, and most memorably as Wesley in The Princess Bride. Please welcome actor and best-selling author, Gary Ellis. Shot the scene. 
I shot the first take of the scene, uh, and uh, he comes up again to me as they're preparing to shoot another angle. And he goes, he just says this to me, he goes, you know you want to. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, what am I going to do, right? So, I, uh, I go, I ask the first assistant director, I go, how long have we got? He goes, you got a few minutes. I go, okay. So I take off my mask. I thought that was a smart move. I get better peripheral vision. And I go up to this all train vehicle, and his bodyguard, he had a bodyguard, I swear to God. <laughs> He goes, oh, it's very easy, governor, it's just like a motorbike, you know? On-off switch, clutch, pedal, brake, that's important. <laughs> and Bob's your uncle, that should have told me everything I needed to know, but I had no business getting on this thing at all. So I get on this thing, and I lurch forward, and I didn't get more than two feet, and I went over a rock, and I broke my left big toe immediately. <laughs> between the clutch pedal and the rocket, it just snapped right away. And we're, we're, we're a week into shooting. And I'm thinking, well, that was fun while it lasted. <laughs> now I'm going to be fired, you know. And I was terrified, absolutely terrified. So, um, luckily, they, uh, they, 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 they patched up my foot with a makeshift splint. I mean, when you saw the toe, it was all the wrong color and pointed in the wrong direction. I was um, but Rob Reiner was very sweet about it. I was terrified to tell him, and he said, don't worry, we'll, we'll move the fight scene to the end of the film, and that should give you enough time to, to heal. So there, there are moments in the film where you can see it's pretty obvious. Like, when I sit down on that log, uh, when I talk to Buttercup about my pig fiancé, you can see me do something really ridiculous with my foot like this. Absolutely ludicrous. And then, and then when I'm running into the fire swamp, it's more of an interpretive dance. <laughs> and it was a bit tender when we were fighting with, with Mandy, so you can probably see it in a couple of moments there. But yes, uh, a lesson learned is, is, is don't get on an off frame vehicle if you don't know what you're doing. No matter, even if a giant tempts you to. <laughs> yes. It's sweet. Giant, like Andre. Very sweet. But so working with him, yes. Like, what was the first day of working with Andre the Giant like for you? Oh, it was very memorable. It was probably the most memorable day of shooting for me because um, <clears throat> we were shooting a scene where we were going to storm the castle, myself and uh, Montoya and uh, and Fezzik. And um, you guys probably know the dialogue better than I do. But it was, <laughs> anyway, we built this. We built a fake parapet wall for the castle, the Florin castle, Alpedix castle. And it was made out of plywood and plaster. And the reason they built it is they wanted a view of the, of the beautiful castle in the background. They wanted us in the foreground, yeah? So they built this lovely set. And there was only about 20 crew members on it. And uh, Rob Ryan, the director, said, well, let's just shoot the rehearsal. So I think I'm playing mostly dead, so I'm passed out at that point. And, and Fezzik says to Montoya something like, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. He goes, uh, I wonder how long before it takes effect about the pill. And then Montoya says, your guess is as good as mine. And then I come to and I say, I'll fight you both together, beat you both, or something like that, right? <laughs> and Andre has the line, I guess not very long, about the pill, right? Well, he didn't get to the word long before he let out the most monumental fart. <laughs> We've all accused each other of giant farts. This was a giant fart. I kid you not. Seriously, someone timed it. It was 16 seconds. That's a long time. And the decibel level, the decibel level. I looked over at the sound guy and he lifted it. Insane, insane. People all covered their ears, and the whole plywood set. <laughs> and I looked up at Andre, which I shouldn't have done. And he had this look on his face, this sort of beatific look, like he was something he'd been holding on to for an age. And he also had steam coming out of the top of his head. I have no idea why to this day, but it just, just, I lost it. And, and so, you know what's so funny is that in, in America, you know, everybody's cool about talking about farts. You're like, oh, dude, open the window or take it outside, whatever. In England, they all get very weird when you fart. They, they, somebody, somebody goes, oh, very weird. They all get very, very 
strange about it. But in this case, because it was so monumental an event, you know, the, you know, far it could be heard in Beijing, that there was a stunned silence when it was over. Just literally, there was no birds tweeting, nothing, nothing, miles around. Just Andre's re relaxation, yeah? And Rob Reiner, the director, broke the silence. I'll never forget what he said. He goes, Hey, Andre, you okay? <laughs> Just like that, it's funny. And Andre, without missing a beat, goes, I am now, boss. <laughs> First day. First day. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, it's fantastic. Can't beat that. I mean, so, so staying in that world and on set, I understand that, that Wally Shawn uh, was a little nervous playing Gazzini. Is that, is that true? Yes, apparently I wasn't the only one who thought he was going to be fired. Uh, Wally was apparently, I didn't know this at the time, he was terrified he was going to be fired because his agent had told him he wasn't the first choice to play Gazzini. Isn't that crazy? Um, and so his agent had told him, by the way, if, you, if you're an agent and you have a client, don't tell them they're not the first choice. It's a terrible thing to tell your client. Nothing that the agent would tell him wasn't the first choice. He told him who the first choice was. He told him it was Danny DeVito. I know, Paul Wally was like, terrified. He went up to Rob Ray and goes, I don't know why you can't be in this role. I'm not even silly. <laughs> I'm a Jew from New York, why you can't? And Rob's like, because you're funny. When you laugh, your face goes red. It's funny. And he would tell everyone. They didn't tell me, but he told for his guest, you know, my bags are packed. I know Danny's on his way. He's just standing in. It was terrible. It was terrible. And um, to this day, I don't think he realizes how great he is in the role. But if you think about it, I mean, as great as Danny DeVito is, no one is better at playing than singing than. than Right? The more they should say, right? And you can think of it, but anyone else would think of it. Anyway, he's such a sweet guy. He told me, he goes, you know, Carrie, you've got it very easy. You know, you've got the three words that you say to people. Do you realize if I drop my keys in public, what happens to me? He said, I, he, if he misses an elevator or a cab or he's late to the gate at the airport, somebody has to go, hey, can <laughs> Says, it's at least 15 to 20 times a day. <laughs> Just so you know, if you think you're saying it to him, you think he hasn't heard it before, I guarantee you, he has. <laughs> yeah. So, it's a movie packed with talent, but I have to ask, yeah. what was it like working with Billy Crystal? Uh -huh. Yes, Billy, the great Billy Crystal. I raised Billy. <laughs> Miracle Max and Valerie at work. They only had three days of work, um, but they had about eight hours of makeup to become those characters. They were marvelous, really funny, and improvised a lot. Um, I'll never forget uh, the first day that I had to shoot with Billy. I had, again, I had very easy to so lay down and play dead and, and just lie on a slab. But um, Billy stayed in character the whole time. Um, I, I went to the commissary, the, the, the studio commissary with him, in character as Miracle Max. And he, he went to the, he took the, the, his tray and stood in line, and he got to the girl behind the counter as Miracle Max, and he's, he's like, eh, eh, this shepherd's pie, is it spicy? Like that. And she goes, I'm not really, sir, I don't think so. And he goes, you don't know my colon. You know, things like that. I'm doing this all day to people, all day, right? So then, we get to the set, and uh, we go to shoot the scene, and uh, we shoot, I think, a rehearsal just to see the places in the market where I was standing. And Rob comes up to me with the monitor and he goes, Carrie, I looked at the monitor and I can see a chest moving. You're going to have to stop breathing for this scene. But how, how long, Rob? He goes, Don't worry, we won't kill you. We won't kill you. And he walked over to Billy and he whispered something in his ear. And I didn't know until this day. Uh, when I started to write the book, what it was that he said to him, and I asked him at lunch, and I said, what did you say to him that day? He goes, you know, want to know what I said? I said, yeah. And he goes, I said, just go for it. <laughs> like that. And I said to myself, but he's already in character. What's he going to do? Well, sure enough, after Rob yelled at you, hey, guys. 
that's, that's a very cool dude right there. Yeah, I mean, it's the Flash. Um, so as soon as Rob yelled action, Billy launched into, you know, three hours of medieval Yiddish stand-up. <laughs> There are kids here, so some of it was not appropriate for children, so I can't remember. But I can just tell the grown-ups it was, had to do with Vikings and sheep. <laughs> anyway, but, and of course everyone lost it, including Rob Reiner. They had to take Rob off the set. His laugh was so loud, they had to move Video Village and the director's chair off the set into the hallway so he could direct from there with, with a microphone because otherwise he'd spoil every take. So that was basically the first day of working with Billy. And uh, I think Mandy said he bruised a rib trying not to laugh. <laughs> Which I didn't even do, we did. Well, I, I would now like to open it up to you guys uh, with your questions. Uh, so feel free to line up behind either microphone. We'll alternate back and forth. Um, if you're up at the microphone, great. And if you're behind that person, if you could just kind of kneel so that we keep those uh, okay. sidelines. That would be awesome. Kids can go to the front. We, we want to hear from the kids first. Yeah. Let the kids go. Hello. Hi. What's your name? Gwen. Hi, Gwen. You're so cute. How old are you? Eight. Yes. <laughs> is, that third, is that third grade? Are you in third grade? Yeah, cool. Awesome. What's your question? Did you have fun filming the movie? Yeah. Yeah. You're so cute. <laughs> Meet other people who, who 
like here and ask them because they, they do it for a living. Okay, and really get their advice. And, yeah. All right, thanks a lot, and uh, you were fantastic in the Barnsdale. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I know they just released that on iTunes. Twenty years. Awesome. Next, hello. What's your name? Joanne. Hi, oh, Joanne. What's your question? Uh, well, first, thank you for uh, providing uh, you know decades of entertainment. Oh, thank you. Genius. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, so uh, you probably heard they're doing a cycle movie this year. Yes. <laughs> Get used to disappointment. <laughs> I know, I know. I was busy shooting another film. I know, I know. It's a big bummer. But at San Diego, they said they want to do six, seven, eight more movies. So. Well, from their lips to God's ears, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> that, like that, that would be up to the fans, I think. So you guys, if you love the film, if you go in great numbers, I'm sure USA will come around and go. Well. Another one's a good idea, so it's up to you guys. So, do you think you might be a part of one in the future? Uh, that would again be up to whether or not they decide to do a second one. And if they do, I, I think they've already told me that will be so. That's up to you. No pressure. Uh, aren't you cute? Seriously. <laughs> Skipping down the aisle. <laughs> you mom? No? Okay, who's next? Um, I really loved your book. Uh, oh, it was an audio book and it was incredible. I was curious if there were any stories that didn't make the cut or that afterwards, after you published it, you said, oh my gosh, I forgot about that. I wish I'd included it. You know, I wish I could tell you that was true, but it's not. I had worked so hard on this and I interviewed so many people and tried to get every possible piece of information regarding the film and the book and everything that I could possibly find, so that this would be the, the quintessential memoir about The Princess Bride, because I, did, I didn't want to have to have an addendum or <laughs> extra pages on the, on the anniversary of reprinting of the book or something. I just wanted to try and get it all out there, so we worked very hard on that. I think that's pretty much it. It's, I, if, if you can think of anything I missed, let me know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, who's next? Is that it? Oh, hi. Uh, I'm Beverly. Hi, Beverly. I'm actually asking a question for my husband because he couldn't be here. Oh, okay. He was curious how you did in the, the scene in the fire swamp yes. coming out of this sand pit. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, the sand pit was built by the special effects team. And what they came up with was they used the trap door on the sun stage at Shepparton where we were shooting. And they took away the trap door, and in its place they put a piece of foam latex rubber, which they cut into the shape of a star. And underneath the foam latex, they put a piece of cardboard and a stick of wood. That's literally what they came up with. And then they poured sand over the entire, they cut out of it like a sand pit, like a, literally like a playpen, sand pit, and poured the sand on top of it. And they showed us how it would work, and they dropped it a bag of uh, a sandbag on top of it, and literally underneath they had cameras underneath, and they could see television, little tiny TV sets, and they could see exactly the timing of it. And the minute the sandbag hit the center of the uh, foam latex, they pulled the stick away, and all the sand in the bag went down, just like a, an hourglass. Yeah, and the stunt folks were beneath, catching the bag, and it was, you know, it was very safe. At least that's what I thought. <laughs> And so when they did this, my stuntman did the first version of the take, uh, and he jumped in butt first, holding his nose, and it didn't look very heroic. <laughs> it was just like a guy doing a belly flop. And I said to Rob, I said, gosh, wouldn't it be great if, if I dove in? And Rob went, jeez, I don't know, Carrie. And I said, please, Rob, let me try it. And the special effects guys went, ah, uh, got that. He just broke his toe. <laughs> this wasn't made for diving in, it's made for jumping in. And if he breaks his neck, we all go up. No. And Rob goes, well, Candy, I mean, you heard it from the special effects guys. I mean, he's right, you know, it wasn't built for diving, it's for jumping. And I said, Rob, let me try one take. Just please, one take. If I get it, great. If we don't, we move on. 
goes, well, what if you break your neck? Then what? I go, I won't break, I swear. And I, and I had no idea, you know, I mean, really crazy. And I asked the stunt guy, he said, so Rob said, let the stunt guy do it for If he can do it, then break his neck. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't say that. He said, yes, he did. Um, and the stunt guy was totally game for it. He did it beautifully. And so then the next take, I did it, and that's what we did. We went home. It was amazing. Thank like, God that we heard this. But yes, it worked. And that's how, how it happened. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Ah, yes. Well, that was interesting only because I spent pretty much 18 days chained to a wall. <laughs> and there was only one person with a key to my, my shackles. And uh, I can assure you I kept a, a very close eye on that person. <laughs> um, yeah, it was amazing, actually. We, like I said, we shot the film in 18 days and uh, very low budget. Cost a million dollars. We had a terrific cast and crew. James Wan, the director, was his first movie, and now he's like this big director now, he's terrific. And he couldn't have been nicer and sweeter, and he just kept this, the, the most wonderful atmosphere on the set, even though it was a very dark film. Funnily enough, we did a lot of laughing, just to, just to get away from the darkness of it, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, not so much for Corbin, because he was laying face down most of the time. Uh, uh, but, but, but yeah, it, it was a lot of fun, believe me. And they're very funny guys, um, James and Lee Wanai. They're from Melbourne, you know, they got that lovely Australian sense of humor. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi again, how are you? Okay. I had a question. Yes. Well, in your book, yes. you mentioned that as a kid you always wanted to be an actor in yes. movies. Yes. Now that you've done movies and yes. TV shows and theater and voice acting, yeah. is well, are movies still your favorite? Good question. I like I like making all all kinds of uh, acting, whether it's film, television. Television is very immediate and very quick. Um, because they have to move very fast. And so usually you get sort of one or two takes in TV because they have to, like I said, they have to move very quickly. And there's something to that because when you're moving very quickly, you don't have a lot of time to overthink things, to overanalyze things, which I tend to do that. If I've got a lot of time sitting around on the set, I'll overanalyze a scene too much sometimes. And, and so there's an immediacy to, to TV that I kind of like. Um, and so at that, help train me better for film because now I stop overthinking things and just do it. Just like Nike like said, so it kind of helps. But yeah, yeah it's fun. I think it's the only thing I really haven't done. So I'd like to, I did one off a of Broadway show, but that was it. So I'd like to try that out. Because that would be fun to do. It's very sweet. Nice to see you again. God bless you. He has spoken in Master Voice and she's a very brave girl. So please give it up. Hello. Who's next? Hello. Hi, what's your name? Uh, my name's David. Hi, David. One of the defining films of my adolescence was uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you could speak to the casting process and whether or not you got the role of his, uh, like other Robin Hoods you could speak with. Ha! 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 You know, it's funny, Mel um, uh, came to the very first reading of Princess Bride, he came with Carl Reiner, because they're all, you know, Rob knows them, he's like Mel's godson or something, you know. And, um, and he couldn't have been nicer. Uh, him and Gene Wilder came up to me after the screening, and I, I literally, I was gobsmacked, I didn't know what to say, because I, I grew up watching these guys, like you, and I was speechless, and they both said so nice things to me, such nice things to me. And I thought, well, that would be, I, I, I was just happy with that. And I was, honestly, it was about a year later, I was sitting at home, and my phone rang, and I picked it up, and it said, Hi, it's Mel Brooks! And I went, yeah, right. And I hung up. <laughs> really, I mean, honestly, why would Mel Brooks be calling me at home? I thought it was one of my friends, like, pulling a friend, you know? And the phone rang again, he goes, don't hang up, don't hang up. 
He told me there on the phone that he wanted me to come in and meet to talk about Robin Hood. So I couldn't believe my luck, honestly. I, I think I called everybody I knew. And uh, I was so excited. And the casting process was amazing, actually. Um, as soon as we saw Dave Chappelle's head, we knew he was amazing. We got it, you know. Uh, I said, we got to get this guy before somebody else does. He's brilliant. And uh, that went from you know, all the cast. I mean, they were all terrific. Um, Amy, everybody. Um, and we had some, again, so I can't remember a day without that. That was hilarious. Um, I'll never forget that. We didn't, we didn't have CGI back then. Uh, or if they did, they would melt it once. Four, four count for it. But, but anyway, he told me, he goes, uh, do you, do you, uh, do you, are you an archer? Do you know how to fire arrows? I go, well, not really. He goes, good, you'll train with fire. <laughs> So he brought an archer onto the set, and then between takes and stuff, and you know, I practiced. But it was dreadful. I mean, dreadful at, at archer. It's really hard. I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried. It's really difficult. You have to aim it slightly differently than where you want it to go. You have to allow for the distance and the wind and all that and stuff, right? So when it came to the day to shoot the scene where I had to get a bullseye and show them all the married men that I was a great archer, I really had not perfected it at all. <laughs> so Mel comes up and he goes, okay, we got maybe five minutes before lunch, so let's get this, right? Okay, let's go. <laughs> no, no, I think I need a little bit more. He goes, no, no, you'll get it, don't worry, don't worry. And I'm thinking, no pressure at all, right? <laughs> First take, wild miss. Come, come, don't worry, next one, get it, next one. Second take, even worse. <laughs> Ended up in a bourbon. <laughs> Third take. A hit, but not the bullseye. Oh, so close. <laughs> Fourth take, I hit a bullseye, and you can see the look of shock on my face. <laughs> and literally after I delivered my line, Mel went, come, punch, let's go. <laughs> Oh, she's terrific, isn't she? Yes. Well, it was that she was a warrior, you know? And it's a sort of a logical progress for her to go from Buttercup to playing out. Um, she's terrific, you know? And look, we, I, I hate to say we told you so, but we knew back then when, when she came in and read for, for, for Buttercup that, that she was a, not only an incredible talent, but just somebody who was going to have an incredible career. And uh, her, her English accent is flawless for an American. It's a very hard accent to do, especially for Americans, you know? And she named, no, I mean, no offense, it's a hard thing. <laughs> American accents are hard for Brits, but English accents are very hard for Americans. Anyway, she nailed it. She, turns out she has a, a, a British stepfather, and she grew up on Monty Python like me. So, I mean, she was the perfect fit for Doctor. But now you look at her, you know, like, uh, uh, on, on House of Cards. House of Cards, everything. She's amazing in everything. And so uh, I'm, I'm very proud of her. I'm very happy for her. She's, she's, uh, she's an extraordinary lady. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, what's your name? Hello, my name is Peter. Hi, Peter. I just have to say that the greatest thing in the world is you doing Mel Brooks. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you, does the recording of uh, I Read a Giant Farting still exist? Ah! Wouldn't that be something? If you wanted to get tinnitus, I would definitely gladly share. No, it's, uh, uh, back then we didn't have um, tape, sadly. It was film only, film in the camera. So, and our, our playback, we didn't have playback. We literally, they had a, they had a TV set, a video hookup, so we could walk, so the director could watch it, but there was no playback for, for anything, so it's all lost. And it, somewhere, that, that fart is floating around me. 
the stratosphere, causing all kinds of problems, I'm sure. But yeah, no, it was an, uh, you had to be there. Or, or somewhere within 300 miles. That is a great loss to the world and a great loss to history. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Hi. What's your name? Adrian. Hi. You're not Hi. Hi. This lady made a dress out of a material from the princess. Can you show everyone your dress? Check it out. She made this dress. Glory, actually. Sure. Um, I love that movie, and I wanted to ask, what was it sort of like on set compared to all the other movies? Because it was, you know, it was much more serious. Yeah, sure. That was a beautiful film to make. I was really proud of that one. A lovely story. I'm, I'm a historian, a history nut, as you probably can tell, looking at my body of work. But yes, it was written by a lovely young man called Kevin John, who sadly is no longer with us. But I couldn't wait to start shooting that film. I was so into it. Somebody just told me today that they uncovered Colonel Shaw's sword somewhere and found it in someone's attic, which I'm dying to find out about. Yes, his diaries, Colonel Shaw's diaries, are in the Horton Museum Library in Boston. So they invited me over and I went over there, I flew over to Boston, and they invited me in and I, I was allowed to, I was probably one of the few people who were allowed to sit down and privately read the diaries, and they were amazing because he kept notes of everything that happened. And so, Ed's with the director was totally into it. We, there was very little CGI on that too. We, all the us, all the battle sequences. That's thousands of extras running across the beach. I mean, it was for real. An amazing, amazing time. Matthew Broderick, Denzel, Mark Morgan, and my gosh, I would just show up to work when I wasn't shooting just to watch them work, just to sit at their feet and study them. They were just so amazing to watch. Incredible, incredible. Uh, it was a real gift for me. A real gift. Real. I learned so much. And um, yeah, love you, Phil. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. What's your name? Uh, my name is Stephanie. Hello, Stephanie. Hi. Um, there are about ten films that I raised my kids on that they can pretty much put by far in here in two of them. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but I didn't want to ask you a question about Princess Bride. I actually wanted to ask you about Twister. Okay. Um, do you have any really good fun stories from that? Because there's nothing better than watching a cow go uh, on in here. <laughs> So I didn't know if there was one particular story. Yeah, well, you know, it's sort of bittersweet for me now because poor Billy is not with us anymore. We lost Billy this year. Yeah, give it up for Billy. To be a great talent gone too soon. Really sweet. I mean, a genuinely lovely man. I mean, a generous spirit. He was exactly who you thought he was. He was that guy. He was always upbeat. Every time he, you could hear it before you saw him, you'd be like, hey, buddy! <laughs> and you just look around where Billy was, you know? He was so funny. When we arrived in Oklahoma, my wife and I, he took one look at us and he goes, you guys aren't ready for Oklahoma. You gotta go get some cowpoke stuff. Come on! And he threw us in the back of the station wagon and we drove to some store and he made us get big belt bottles of cowboy boots and cowboy hats and when we came out of the store he took pictures of me he's like, now nah, you're ready to work, man! <laughs> he was a great guy. I mean, he was a sweetheart. A total, total sweetheart. So I have nothing but fond memories of, of him on that film. And, and, and so his spirit is very much alive for me. And uh, so I, I remember him, really, I guess, most of all. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, my name is Amber. Hi. Hi. Slight social anxiety, so I wrote it down. <laughs> so thank you so much for everything you've done. I'm a lifelong fan. You've been the face and the voice of all of my greatest heroes, from Wesley to Garrett to Robin Hood. And as uh, I admire that whenever an actor challenges himself to a new role, I still got to wonder, how did you make that enormous jump from suave, debonair hero to adulterous jerk? Uh, <laughs> like, how did you end up in that role? Bonus challenge, should you choose to accept it? Fun story from Simon. Oh. <laughs> Hold on. Sorry. <laughs> uh, 
I know. Which, which adulterous jerk was I playing? No, it was a... Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. 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 Why, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to bring it in there, so I haven't had all my coffee yet. Uh, yes, how did I make that transition? I, I, I really just enjoyed reading the script. I thought it was so innovative. And for those of you who haven't seen it, I can't ruin it for you, but it was a very unique ending for the film. And it was kind of reminding me, like of Hitchcock, where they, 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 they said, no one can come into Psycho after the movie started and we can't share the secret. So it was a very cool idea. I thought they were very smart, Lee and James, what they came up with. But I don't really, I don't judge the character. I learned very early on, I read a book, um, an autobiography by Lawrence Olivia, a wonderful English actor. And in it, he said, I never try to judge the characters I play. Because if I do, I'm making up the, I'm making up the audience's mind for them, if I judge them, right? So I try not to judge the roles I play. Uh, I know that's not, it sounds weird, but it's, it's, it's helped me enormously. So I just look at the character and I find what things I think I can tap into that help, you know, develop the character. And uh, that's really all I do. I don't try to judge them at all. But I try and have fun doing it. I don't, I, I don't want to be too maudlin. I always try and find some humor in the characters I play. Because um, I think that's life, you know. Even in the darkest times, we find humor, you know. But what was your other question? I'm sorry. Oh, my husband wanted to know if we had more fun stories from the romantic chemistry and psych. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Well, let's see. Oh, where do I begin? Those guys are so crazy. I mean, the outtakes, those outtakes are available. Um, you can go online and look at them. I mean, we, I, 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 these guys ruined so many takes. For them. <laughs> so many. Um, uh, but, you know, Dooley, first time I worked with him, I didn't know he had that little girlish scream. <laughs> and I lost it when I heard it. He was running around like, like that, and I just went, no way, no way. And then like, Carrie, that's what he does, that's his Carrie. Like, no, we can honestly, they talk about laughing, I mean, hysterical belly laughs on that show. Um, they're very silly, very, very silly. Yeah, I think that's why the show is so popular. So, fingers crossed, we'll come back and do another one. Just a few more minutes left, so we'll have time for a couple more questions. Okay. Hi there, good afternoon. Hi, uh, what's your name? Uh, my name's Troy. Hi, Troy. Uh, we had a chance to chat briefly yesterday. Uh, and this is another glory question. Okay. And you had kind of mentioned this uh, the story when you were on set, and in the Civil War, the story had got to come to set. That's right. And basically share uh, with you the cast. And as a history teacher, I'd love to kind of hear what he shared with you, and since he has since passed away, especially show us about that. So, this gentleman came to the booth yesterday, and he's a his, uh, film, uh, you're a history teacher, right? That's right. Good for you, by the way. Um, and I said to him, you know, that great saying is that we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. It's one of my favorite sayings, because uh, it seems that no one seems to adhere to it at all. Um, yes, we were shooting uh, the, uh, the attack on Fort Sumter, and the director at Squick called Cuck and said, okay, I'm the cast and crew, everybody come to the camera, right? crew meeting. So we all sat down by the camera, and, and Ed said, we have a very special guest who's come to visit us today. And uh, he presented Shelby Foote, who wrote the quintessential books on the Civil War, one of the great Civil War historians of all time. And you're right, sadly, he's no longer with us. And he sat there on a log and proceeded to tell us the exact detail of what happened during the, the storming of Fort Sumter. I mean, and, and also about the Civil War and the effects it still has just have on us today. And um, an incredible human being, really bright, really sweet, very funny too. And uh, really what he said was that the, it tore the country apart because you had brothers fighting brothers, cousins fighting cousins, parents fighting children. He said it was the most traumatic time in American history, more so than the revolution, because you had Americans fighting Americans. Yeah? He said it's, it's, it, it, it tore his heart apart, and that's why he wrote the books, because he wanted to make sure that nothing like that would ever happen again. So, um, yeah, it was a real gift. And, and for me, being an, you know, an amateur historian, I mean, I, I literally was one of 
what a blessing, you know. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So um, I was uh, reflecting uh, the other day, uh, thinking about Mandy's story about the bruised rib and yes. you know, holding laughter, and it just kind of dawned on me how many you know heavyweight comedic talents you you know worked with. Billy Crystal, of course. You also mentioned Dave Chappelle, um, Mel Brooks, and uh, and it was just um, I was wondering. Uh, obviously, the Miracle Max, as you mentioned, was you know very difficult for everyone involved to kind of you know, keep composure. Was there ever anyone you've worked with that was even more difficult than that to not perform so during the scene? Anyone else? Well, I, like you said, I worked with some of the great talent. Jim Carrey was hard. Uh, he, um, in my mind, there's a scene where he fights himself in the bathroom. <laughs> you remember that? Well, that was a concrete floor he threw himself. He threw his head onto the concrete floor, and you could, the same gasp that you guys all just did was exactly what the cast and crew behind camera did when he did it. And we all thought, oh, that's it, we're done, because he's going to crack his, he's cracked his skull open, for sure, it's a concrete floor. He got up and did it again. <laughs> he was extraordinary, I mean, really, so, so crazy and hilarious. So, I have had incredible blessings working with some of the great comedians in the industry, so I, I never take that for granted. I'm very, very blessed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Take one of the first floor for autographs, uh, and on behalf of everyone here, thank you so much for spending time with us.